Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Welcome to Prime Time at the BU Library. The Friends of the uh, Bethel University Library collaborate with the Faculty of Development and other offices on campus to bring, bring you programming that celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom at Bethel uh, and involves students, faculty, and staff. So we're so glad everyone's joined us today and I've been asked to give a preview. So the next one will be November 9 at 11.15 for a special Bethel at 150 years presentation. So this is our 150th year as an institution and we're going to hear from Emeritus Professor of Art History, Wayne Rosa. He retired very recently and he's going to share research he did during his last semester about the aesthetic philosophy developed for Bethel's campus by the founder of the Bethel Art Department, Eugene Johnson. So why this campus looks so beautiful and that we planned it in part, all right? Uh, you won't want to miss this special presentation. And today we have a very special opportunity. We have an Edgren Scholars presentation. The Edgren Scholars supports faculty and student research teams as they collaborate on a research project. And the project needs to have the potential to make a significant contribution to their field and to have a meaningful collaboration between the student and the faculty member. So it's named after our founder, John Alexis Edgren. And one of the key principles that he wrote about in the 19th century was, I love this one, that the relation between teachers and pupils shall not be that of commander and subject, but one of true friendship and helpfulness. And I think that's just um, a tremendous statement from the very start of our institution. And I certainly can see how that follows through today. So um, the Edgren Scholar Program encourages and facilitates that whole faculty and student collaboration, that working together. So today we have Edgren Scholars, Dr. Rachel Anderson and Senior Paisley Buchanan from the Psychology Department, and they're going to discuss their study comparing the psychological stress in animals learning a working memory task under different environmental stressors. So congratulations, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So before I get started, um, I wanted to see if any of Paisley's faculty, prof current professors are here. I'm wondering if we could talk about failing her. <laughs> um, I need her for another year. Yep. So <laughs> that's awesome. Okay, yeah, I, I needed to get that settled. Um, I could fail her, but that might seem like some weird, like, conflict of interest thing. So if I can get an outsider. You want to pay for my another year, then I can. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> okay. Um, Paisley and I have been working together all summer, and this was truly collaborative. It was almost independent. Paisley is pretty amazing, so I'm super excited to talk about what we were doing this past summer. Um, so if this is not going to work, we're going to use this. Okay. So it might sound simplistic to say that learning is essential for survival, but it's super true. Right? Everything that you know about your life and who you are was learned. In fact, there are very few things that we're born knowing how to do. So even if you don't remember learning it, it might have been unconscious, but you did learn this. This is all information that you learned. So for example, the fact that you know how to behave in this context is learned. The fact that you learned how to dress yourself and how to walk. The fact that you know that your hands belong to you. I'm learning is learned because my four month old just found his hands recently. <laughs> Um, I think he knows they're his, but actually I, I'm not sure just yet. But all of that is learned, okay? And learning changes throughout the lifespan. So as infants, you learn a lot very quickly. And as we get older, it gets a lot harder to learn. Ask anyone who's an adult trying to learn a second, langu second language. It does not come easily. And so if we're interested in knowing why these learning changes occur or um, what causes learning from a neurological perspective, we can study humans, and we do, but if we really want to understand the neural underpinnings, it helps to have an animal model. So for the most part in neuroscience, the animal model that we use to know the neural underpinnings of learning and memory are rats. Now, a lot of you are going to be thinking, rats are very different from humans. What could we possibly learn about learning by studying rats? And yes, they are super different, but actually, their way they learn is very similar to the way humans learn. 
So in the early 1900s, the general process theory of learning was proposed that suggests that learning operates under universal laws. Now I'm going to say that this is a theory. However, decades of data support this. So data that comes from almost all species typically is similar to the way humans learn. So we can learn a lot by studying animals. Um, so by studying how animals learn and remember, we actually learn a lot about the human condition. Okay, so how do we teach animals, right? If you've ever seen a movie, you've seen animals do some pretty incredible things, things that they're naturally predisposed, or predisposed to do, right? So standing on their high, langu high legs for interest, for interest or you know, performing some outrageous trick at a certain time. Um, all animals learn really the same way. They need to be motivated. Right? And humans do too. For any of us who work with undergraduates, we know that they are typically motivated by something, and you need to find that motivation to get them to show up and do well in class. Right? Sometimes that's just a letter grade, sometimes it's a career, sometimes it's peers, or to maintain sports. But they are motivated, and animals are too. And what we do is find something that they are motivated by to get them to learn. So almost all learning experiments result in some sort of motivating factor. And for almost all animals and some undergrads, this is food. <laughs> right. OK, so food is really easy to manipulate for animals. Um, food is necessary for survival. Um, however, a satiated animal is not interested in food. If it is full, if it has all the food it needs to meet its me metabolic requirements, it will not do anything for food. So unlike humans, who can always find room for a donut, for the most part, rats, if they're full, aren't interested, right? You can tempt them with anything, and they're just not going to perform. So this is all very important to say that we need to then make food rewarding by typically keeping rats a little bit hungry. Now. There's a fine balance between hungry and starvation, which I'll talk about, but just a little bit hungry so that when food is around, they will do something for food. And you get a hungry animal, a hungry dog, you can get it to do just about anything, right? Um, so this is kind of where we begin when we're studying the neuroscience of learning and memory, is restricting access to the thing that animals find motivating and then training them on the task that we're interested in. Okay. So I just want to talk about how the neuroscience of learning and memory is typically conducted so you understand where Paisley and I decided to see how to change things up. Okay, so this is very standard across almost any laboratory that you see that is doing this kind of work. To get animals motivated for food, we food restrict them. So typically an animal that's given free access to food, right, the food 24 hours a day, um, as much as they want, they don't have to do anything for that. We call that free fed weight. So animals will typically eat as much as they want and then they kind of stabilize their body weight. What we then do is we food restrict them in such a way that they're maintaining about 85% of that weight. Now, 85% is actually not that detrimental to the animal. Um, they're not starving, for, uh, for instance. Um, instead, actually, they're highly motivated for food and actually more healthy. So rats that are domestic will eat much more than rats that eat in, uh, in the wild. So an 85% um, domestic rat is typically actually the weight that it would be if it was in the wild. And they're also much healthier from a physiological standpoint. So this is not a hardship, right? The food restriction is not necessarily a hardship. But it does propose um, a experimental setup, which is that when animals are food restricted, they no longer can be socially housed. So rats are social creatures. They typically live in groups, and they talk to each other. You can't hear it, but they use ultrasonic vocalizations to chat, and they play. Um, and they also form social hierarchies. So while these hierarchies aren't as you know, well demonstrated as in dogs and in monkeys, they do have a dominant member that will win <laughs> the food. So this is a problem, right? Imagine that we have a cage of rats and we're going to food restrict them to 85% of their weight. Now typically what this means is that for an hour each day they get their food and that's all they get and they need to maintain that weight in that one instance. In socially housed animals, typically what happens is one rat gets all the food and all the other rats don't. So maintaining this, you know, 85% body weight becomes very challenging and 
truly impossible to do when we have rats that are housed in a cage together. So in standard operating procedures, what we do is we singly house animals. So we take rats away from their little buddies, they're in their own little cage and they're maintained at the set point. And again, the end result is that you can motivate animals to do anything, right? So typically then, we're going to put the animals in some sort of condition that we're interested in studying. Um, so I'm, my research has primarily focused on the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is found on the front of your brain, and we like to think of it as kind of housing these higher order cognitive aspects. Um, so particularly one that I'm interested in is working memory. So working memory is the task of maintaining something active in your mind, right? And we're doing this all the time. So in a conversation, working memory is remembering what you just said, what you want to say, want to say and how you respond to someone when they talk to you back, right? You're maintaining that conversation in your head. Um, working memory is when you're at the grocery store and you're trying to remember what you have at home so you know what to get, but what's already in your cart and where you need to go next, right? So this is a function that's typically housed by the prefrontal cortex and we can get an animals to do a working memory task that then allows us to understand how the prefrontal cortex is functioning. So I can put a rat through a task that will do that. Or I could put a rat through a task called a Skinner box, right? So for those of you who've maybe taken intro to psych, you know what a Skinner box is. It's an operant conditioning uh, chamber where we train an animal to typically press a lever. And this really does allow us to do a lot of neurological um, studies, understanding what's going on in the brain. But again, to do this, rats need to be motivated. So when you have a rat that's 85% of its body weight, you, you get training really quick, really easy, and you can reward them with chocolate. Rats love chocolate. They love mini chocolate chips. That's typically what I use. Cereal is also a really good motivator. But you can also use just regular food, right? If they are hungry, you can motivate them to just do anything just for their regular food. So this is how studies of learning and memory are typically done. This is a problem in my mind. Okay, my PhD work was studying stress effects on cognition. So I was really interested in how does stress influence our day-to-day -day lives? How does stress influence our capacity for working memory? Well, my control group was singly housed animals. And we know from living through a pandemic that being deprived of social contact is stressful, right? When you are deprived from interacting with your peers in some capacity, we know that that leads to increases in mental illnesses such as depression and anxiety, but it also de decreases physical health. So we know this in humans, and we know this in rats too. This is not new information. It is well documented that rats who experience singly housed situations are stressed. So I'm doing my PhD and I have control animals that are in baseline stress conditions, and I'm comparing them to experimental animals that have an added stressor, and I'm trying to decipher stress's role in learning and memory, and I'm really struggling because my control condition is stressed also. Now, my boss at the time did not have the capacity to really allow me to do this experiment, right? Um, this is just how the world runs in neuroscience of learning and memory. Who am I to buck this trend? Well, as soon as I was able to do my own independent research, I'm super interested in this, right? How can I actually tease out the role that stress is playing in learning and memory when my control group is not housed and not ethologically ethol relevant? Right, rats live in social groups. If we're interested in learning and memory in its natural setting, I'm no longer studying that. So the goal for me was to really try to tease this apart. Um, but to understand why I'm really concerned about my control being stressed, I wanna talk a little bit about the stress response. So there's two main pathways that your body operates on when you're under stress. So this first one that I'm showing you here is the simple, uh, sim sympathomedullary pathway, the SAM pathway. And this is like what we think of typically when we think of the fight or flight response, right? So I always use this in the classroom and this is like fantastical, but we're, just imagine if we're all sitting here and like a bear like come, came like towering in, right? And just was like rumbling around. <coughs> that sounds hilarious, but you'd be very, very stressed out. Okay, so what's gonna happen 
is your heart rate's going to increase, your breathing rate's going to increase, and you are going to most likely flee. That would be my professional advice. You could fight. <laughs> I'm not gonna bet on you to win that one, but you could, right? So adrenaline is going to be released really quickly and you're going to have a really quick and fast stress response. Uh, the stress pathway, pathway that I'm most interested in that was called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access or the HPA access. Okay, so in this case, what the hypothalamus is going to do um, is release a hormone, right? So your hypothalamus is really important for a lot of these autonomic physiological responses of the body. It's going to send via a hormone to the anterior pituitary gland to release another hormone from your adrenal gland, which sits above your kidney in this lovely diagram that I have here for you, um, and going to release cortisol, right? So cortisol is what a lot of people refer to as the stress hormone. I'm fine with you thinking of it in that context, but cortisol is critical for your survival, right? So cortisol is not a bad hormone, right? It's very good, it is very adaptive. In a stress response where this bear is coming at us, it is going to mobilize energy reserves. So you have the capacity to get away and run as long as you need to fight or flee, right? And then it's gonna shut down and you're gonna go back to baseline. Humans have this incredible ability though to stress ourselves out in ways that are not real, that are all in your head. So imagine you have an undergrad, I think maybe some of you can relate to this. You're an undergrad and you realize you missed a deadline, so you're gonna fail this assignment. And then you realize, okay, now I'm gonna get a D in this class. Okay, that means my GPA is gonna suck. That means I'm not gonna get into grad school. That means I'm not gonna get a job and now I'm gonna live with my parents in my basement forever. Has anyone ever done that? I do this all the time. Okay, this is imaginary. This is not reality, but guess what? Your body is responding as if a bear is attacking you, right? When you do this fantastical thinking in your head, your body doesn't know that it's not actually under threat. So you're constantly activating this HPA system, which means your, body, your body's being flooded with cortisol. And my whole PhD work is how when your body's being exposed to this chronically, things go wrong. They go very wrong. Okay, so we know that when you are exposed to high levels of this under chronic periods, your brain reorganizes, your body reorganizes, and you think and work differently. Right? And I'm not going to get into the details of it, but this is why my singly housed animals is a problem. Right? Because my singly housed animals, I know, are under chronic elevations of this. Right? So my control group is significantly stressed just by the fact that they're socially isolated. So I'm going to have Paisley talk more about this experiment, but I wanted to like, show that in my group um, that this is happening as well. So these are isolated animals versus pair housed animals, and I assayed cortisol from their blood, right? So how I do this is I um, get blood from the tail vein. It's kind of like a finger prick. It's very quick, it's very pretty painless. The rats don't even really know that I did anything to them. Um, and it allows me to see how much cortisol is circulating in their blood. Now there's two ways I can do this. I can do this following, I can do this following a stress response. So I can expose them to acute stress see their HPA axis activity, or I can just take baseline levels. And in this instance, I'm in, interested in baseline because that's telling me how the body's operating in a normal, non-stressed out condition. And what you should see here is my isolated animals show significantly higher baseline cortisol levels. So this is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, being flooded with this hormone. Somehow, my control condition does not seem very much like a control condition anymore. So really what I'm interested in getting at <laughs> is can we get animals who are pair housed and therefore not food restricted, right? Because we cannot food restrict in animals that are pair housed. Can we get them to learn so now I can actually have a good control group? So Paisley, I'm going to have you continue. Yeah. So that brings us to our research question. Can pair housed rats learn like the isolated rats? And beyond that, can they learn in the same time period can they learn at the same level? So are they gonna take the same amount of test sessions? Are they gonna take longer? This is information that we wanna know. So what can you teach a rat? Well, we started with 20 male rats and we divided them randomly into two groups. So pair housed, as in two of them sharing a cage, and single housed, one of them by themselves. 
And we had, um, the first few weeks that we had them, we didn't food restrict them. We just, um, I handled them and made sure that they got comfortable with me and also gave them chocolate. So they got used to eating chocolate because rats tend to be hesitant about new foods. Um, and then we also, and then after those two weeks, we um, did the whole food restriction, doing 85% of their free feeding weight. And then we let the pair house ones have unlimited food. And we did this because I did some preliminary research with Anderson uh, the spring before this project, and I saw that um, I could get them to eat chocolate in the teammates, which I'll explain next. And so I just wanted to see if I could get them to learn the same exact task. Um, but I'll get into why that got screwed up later on. Um, so what we wanted them to learn is this team maze. And as you can see, it's just this hall with the left and a right hand um, corner. And what we were going to get them to do is alternate every time they got into the maze. So I would pick them up, put them in the maze right here, and I want them to pick right, I'll pick them up, put them back in, left, pick them up, put them back in, right, left, right, left and I want them to do it pretty perfectly. Um, and this is a good model for them to learn or a good um, procedure for them to learn because when you're picking a procedure of something you want the rat to learn, you have to pick something that's different enough from their normal behavior but is still natural to them. So the team maze works really well because they do have a tendency to explore. They do have a tendency to like alternate and kind of try to find new places to see if there's food over here or food over here. Um, but they're not going to do a perfect right, left, right, left pattern if, you know, by themselves. So that brings me to the next one. Um, so how do we do this? So if you've ever trained your dog, you probably know that you can't go straight to like roll over or like that bang one where they like lay and they look like they're dead. Um, <laughs> they have to learn a lot of other tasks before that. And so rats are similar. Um, rats are kind of near the bottom of the food chain, so they're really afraid of new environments and new places and new sounds. So the first thing that we have to do is we just have to put them in the tea maze. Um, so the first part is called habituation, and what I would do is I put the rat in the maze, I covered it with chocolate, that's what all the X's are, and we just let him sit there and give him five minutes to maybe look around, sniff over here, groom himself, and it takes them a really long time to get comfortable, so we would give them um, as many days as they needed to get around and get eating chocolate. Um, and once they got used to like eating chocolate, um, I forgot to mention, um, their, their stress response in stressful situations is freezing. So this is why it's important to get them moving around at least, because otherwise they're just not going to move at all. Versus like you might think, oh, well, won't they run around, won't they um, like still explore, but no, they need to be comfortable and not getting into their like freeze. Um, so anyways, so in habituation, once I could get them to eat around five chocolates in five minutes, then I would graduate them up to forced alteration, and I would do this um, individually per rat. So if it took one rat one day to do this, then I would move them on to forced alteration the next session. Otherwise, um, I would just give them as much time as they need. And I, so they're all on different schedules, and I would keep track of what day is what thing for them. Um, and so then they move on to forced alteration. And this is where I block one side of the maze and put chocolate on the other side. And I put them in, and I kind of force them to go to the left side. And then I pick them up, switch the block to the other side, put the chocolate in the one over here and then put them down and then they pick that side. And I'm just trying to get them to learn that I'm gonna alternate, I'm gonna feed them, and they need to go specifically into the corners of this maze. Um, and as soon as they could do eight to 10 of these in five minutes, then I know that they're ready to graduate to the next step, which is spontaneous alteration. So now I'm putting chocolate in one side of the maze and I'm letting them explore around and pick a side. And so if they pick the side with the chocolate, they got it right. And I'll just move the chocolate to the other side, pick them up, put them back in, let them go again, and count that as one correct. Otherwise, if they pick the wrong side, then I'm not going to let them have chocolate. They've received their punishment. They didn't pick the right side. <laughs> I'm going to pick them up, and I'm going to keep this chocolate here because I'm not trying to get them to follow my right-left, right-left pattern. I'm trying to get them to alternate right-left, right-left. 
So then I put them back in, and they've learned, oh, it wasn't on this side, it needs to be on the alternate side. And so then they would do that. And once they um, got to 8 to 10 correct, or um, I think I was more precise than that, 10 correct, um, then I would graduate them. Otherwise, if they would do phenomenal, phenomenally bad, I would move them back to forced alteration to get them to work on that pattern a little bit more. And then finally, we move on to the testing and the memory test. So for the test, I'm no longer manipulating them. We're trying to see if they actually did learn to alternate by themselves, right, left, right, left. So for the first testing session, they have eight chances, eight trials. And I put chocolate on both edges of the teammates. And I let them go, and I let them pick. And I record how many they get right, how many times they alternated to the opposite side. And if they get 8 out of 10, then I move them on to a memory test. If they don't get 8 out of 10, then I move them back um, to get them to learn that pattern again. Um, and then the memory test would be a, a separate session where now we have nine trials, so nine times putting them in the maze. And we have the same chocolate on each end. And now I'm doing three trials where they have a 45 second break in between trials. So I'm putting him in, letting him pick a side, taking him out, waiting 45 seconds, or it was 30 seconds for the first one, putting him in, seeing if he can get those right, and he'll have three times doing that. And then I take him out and I wait 45 seconds, and then we do three more trials to see how many he gets corrected there. And then we have 60 second trials. So after a minute, can he remember which side he picked last time? Um, and then, yeah, that was the memory test. So, this worked really well for the isolated rats, because they're hungry, they're motivated, and they are generally the control for these types of experiments. They do a very good job. Um, we do this for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> the pair house rats uh, are weird. Um, the first time I did it with them, they were eating chocolate, and I was really optimistic, like, oh my goodness, I'm going to get to move on to forced alteration. Um, but they stopped eating chocolate. They are like, oh, this is boring now, I'm just going to sit here. And so I tried, I really wanted them to eat chocolate because I thought that that would make the experiment great um, if they could do the exact same task. Um, so I tried a bunch of things. I tried like kind of like shoving them down to the bottom. I tried um, like blocking them, like trapping them in a corner and waiting until they ate the chocolate. <laughs> um, and I would just try to like jump to spontaneous alteration. You know, I tried a bunch of different things um, and it just wasn't working. And eventually they started to learn, but not the task that I wanted them to. They eventually started to learn that, oh, she's gonna block me if she puts me in the side of the teammates. I'm gonna hang out in the middle. Um, <laughs> and so here's a video, if it will load. Um, and this is to give you an idea of what it looks like for a rat to just stay in the middle, not wanna pick a side. It's only a couple seconds. So as you can see, he's poking his head in one side, poking his head in the other. No, I'm not gonna go in, I'm not gonna go in. I'm not gonna go in. And they would do that for like five minutes. Um, <laughs> And so I decided I'm going to poke them. <laughs> um, I needed these guys to learn. Um, and so I was going to try uh, different procedures to get them to move along. And I was going to give up on the whole chocolate idea because it's still valuable to know that like they're learning. They're learning that they're going to get trapped if I put them in the, the corner. So they're still going to learn this task. I just need to find a different um, stimulus to get them to do that. And so I started my finger. Um, which was very impractical right away um, because I, the, the maze is on the ground and so I'm like leaning over and like poking them as they move across um, and it was getting them to move but eventually I moved to um, this stick um, that had like a kind of an L-shaped stick and I wanted to be as consistent as possible on the amount of pressure I was using for them because that's what makes a good stimulus is being consistent um, and so what I did is I had the stick kind of like a hockey stick and I would twist my wrist to like kind of lightly tap him. Um, and if you can think about it, like I can poke as hard as I want, but you can only have so much force in your wrist. And that way I was being more consistent and I was able to follow him better instead of like trying to lean over and like follow him along the maze. And so this is a version of negative reinforcement, um, which means that I am giving him an aversive stimulus. In other words, a stimulus that he doesn't like up until he does the thing that I want him to do and then I stop and give him a break. 
Um, and so what this looks like is habituation was the same, getting used to exploring, moving around. Forced alteration looked like um, things being blocked and then me um, tapping him until he got into the side that I wanted him to and then stopping, giving him a rest, taking him out and putting him back. Um, spontaneous alteration looked like um, no blocking, but I tap him, tap him, tap him, and if he picks the correct side, I stop tapping him, take him out, put him back in. Otherwise, spontaneous alteration, if he picks the wrong side, is tap, 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 picks the wrong side, I keep tapping him, right? Because the other rats with the chocolate learned that, oh, if I pick the wrong side, I'm not gonna get chocolate. I want these rats to also learn, if I pick the wrong side, I don't, like, I don't lose this tapping, this annoying girl who's tapping me. Um, and testing looks like um, I put them in, and I don't touch them, and I let them pick. Or I tap them if they really weren't moving, I tap them up, up until that junction and let them pick with no punishments. Um, and so, yeah, it's an example of negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement being, you know, the presence of the chocolate, negative reinforcement means that increasing behavior by taking away something that they don't like. <laughs> so, the results. Um, the first thing I found was that they tested out um, very similarly, like it was, there was no difference between groups, meaning that they, in terms of um, is the rat gonna test out yes or no, they tested at the exact same level, so there was no difference in um, the number of rats that tested from the pair house and the number of rats that tested from the single house. So this is huge news. Um, additionally, it didn't take them that many sessions. Um, and I had to omit habituation for reasons I explained before. I took a long time in habituation, and that's not fair, that's not reflecting the rat's behavior, that's reflecting my um, trying to test things out on them. And so I took that section out, um, but after that, once we were able to move to forced alteration, spontaneous alteration, and testing, um, they did the exact same in terms of time. Um, and that's this graph over here. And then additionally, for the memory test, they did also no significant difference. They did just as well on the memory test, they were remember remembering it just the same. Um, in the very beginning, um, not sorry, for the first testing session that wasn't the memory test, there were slightly higher test scores for the isolated animals, meaning that they were averaging around 8.7 out of 10, versus the pair house animals were slightly less, like 8.1 out of 10, but they're still passing. They're still learning the task. It wasn't um, same in that regard, and they're also doing just as well with the memory, which are is interesting. So. Um, so some things to take away. Um, I would have loved to be more like consistent right from the beginning, knowing that like I needed a different stimulus to get them to learn, um, to take less time with habituation. It would also be nice to automate things um, to make it more um, easy to tell. So when they were picking a side, I determined which side they were picking based on um, if all four paws were inside the um, arm that they picked. Um, and it, that's a hard thing to tell, that's kind of a guess. Um, and so I would love to have equipment that actually shows me that like, yes, all four paws are inside. Um, as well as having something else do the poking for me would have been really nice. <laughs> um, and because a huge issue is trying to keep consistency, right? Because I'm trying to be consistent, but I'm a human versus a machine would be much better at being consistent and delivering um, that punishment. Um, but what's interesting is I did a literature review beforehand, but I also did a literature review afterwards because as soon as I changed my methods, I was looking at positive versus negative reinforcement in rats, which this should be really basic and standard, right? This is you know, positive versus negative reinforcement. There's gotta be research on this. And there really isn't. There's one study, I cited it here, and it was done in 1963. <coughs> which means that we have done so much research on stress in rats, we know how harmful it is to them, and we don't even know if these other methods could be better. That's something that <laughs> we should probably know. <laughs> um, so for me, this was largely a proof of concept experiment, right? Can animals that are pair housed learn this task if food is not motivating to them? Because again, food is the motivator. In all learning and behavior studies, we reinforce behavior with food. It is easy and it works 
so well, right? I mean, those things we house animals are just like joys to work with, yes. right? <laughs> they get the task, they do well. It's really easy. But my problem, again, stems from the fact that I'm a stress researcher and I know that my control group is under this baseline stress, so what am I actually comparing? That's where it stemmed from, but additionally, I think I'm like a total like animal softy, right? I, I want them to be just like happy and content. And like when you see pair house animals, they like play together and they snuggle together. And it's just like they clearly have a better quality of life. So I really am trying to move away from singly housing animals. And I'm very interested in working memory. So to, I need to do working memory tasks. Can I do them with singly housed animals? I think the takeaway is that yes, we can. But for me, this is just really the beginning. Um, we really need to automate this in a better way, maybe find the stimulus that is easy to utilize and get the animals to learn without necessarily compromising our experimenter's life <laughs> <laughs> or the rat's life. So this is, again, just a proof of concept for me. Um, but I think what I'm really hoping for, and hopefully we'll get some conversations as we present this elsewhere, is that stress is a latent variable in all of these conditions. And all of this research stresses this underlying factor that no one talks about, right? And again, we as experimenters, we as the, we as the neuroscience community are just like, I just, we know, but this works. So like, you don't really want to change what works, right? It works really well for a reason. But stress is a latent variable in all of this data. And I am not the only one who's like, taking up this charge, there's a bunch of people who are doing this ethologically relevant research, right? Research that matters and makes sense to the ethological natural environment of the animal. So hopefully this is continued and we move forward as a, as a society, as a community of neuroscience behavior researchers. But um, again, this is kind of a really amazing first step. And, and Paisley did so much great troubleshooting, like she became a true scientist in this, right? What do we do when things don't work? We try again. So it was a pleasure to work with her. Um, but at, at this point, we'll take any questions that you may have. Yes, Angela. Yes, I have two questions. The first is just so that I can understand why you can't food uh, restrict paired animals because you could, like to tease apart mm -hmm. things, right? You could remove them singularly to check them in the teammates, right? Mm -hmm. Do they get aggressive with each other? I'm just thinking because like if you could show that that being paired mitigates some of the stress, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't understand. So, totally. so doing pair house and doing food restriction. Right. Yes. So do you want to take that? Yeah. Or do you want me to? I can take okay. it. Um, so rats have like dominance hierarchies, and so if we provide food to one cage and there's two rats in there, um, one of them will take all of that food and shove and push the other one. I see this with them all the time, like even when I give them water, they're like shoving each other to be able to drink from the water. Um, and so it's harder to be able to see if they're both being restricted at the same level because they're not going to like eat that food fairly, essentially. Oh. Mm -hmm. So there's not a way to feed them separately, but keep them housed together. So typically, so people who do do that, it's a, it's an added time budget. So typically, what happens in labs that do do this is. Um, <laughs> You hold the rat on your lap and feed it individually, but that takes a really, really long time. You have to time it when they're hungry and willing to eat and they have to be comfortable. So most labs don't do that. You can definitely do it, but it's super not convenient. And does the gender of the rat at all make any difference with anything? Oh, yes, I would love that question. So and the subset of my PhD work is stress differences between the sexes. Um, so in my in my research on this, females are more likely to perseverate in the working uh, memory task. So what I mean by that is they're more likely to keep choosing the same arm over and over again, especially following stressful conditions, right? So for um, I would say the analogous human is the rumination behavior. Um, so I would get females who were exposed to chronic stress who would just keep change keep choosing the same arm. Um, but as far as like learning goes at a baseline condition, I have never seen learning differences between sexes. Thank you. That's a great question. 
Yeah. Um, once you change the stimulus for the rats that were pair housed, um, why did you keep food restricting the singularly, sing, um, the isolated housing one if you started using different stimulus? Um, so we used different stimulus for each group completely. Um, so the single housed ones, as soon as they graduate, we started feeding them more, but we still <coughs> needed them to be motivated to eat the chocolate. Um, and so if we can, where the whole uh, premise of this was to see if by um, food restricting and by using a different stimulus, if they could learn the same task just as well. So this is for the purpose of eventually trying to move to experiments where we can teach them without having food restrict. Yeah, and just to like kind of <coughs> back off of that, um, I wanted to compare the control condition, right? The control condition in learning behavior is a uh, food restriction, right? So I wanted to see like if we take our control baseline group, do we get significant differences when we like do our own, like we're making this up paradigm? <laughs> um, I think eventually then the idea would be to actually study the effects of social isolation on working memory then, we would use the same stimulus between groups and no animals would be food restricted um, just to tease out the social isolation. But we're not there yet, this was just the first step. That's a great question though. Yeah. Did you guys do any like recall tests like like a day after or like any termination tests after they learned? Um, <laughs> so there's a couple ways to answer that question. The first is that, so in the memory test itself, technically that is a recall, right? So they're not getting rewarded or punished for doing right or wrong. We're just seeing what they know. So there's, they're not learning in that task. It's like if you choose left, great, and then we put you in. If you choose left again, we're marking it down as you did badly, but you don't know that, and you're not getting additional information. Um, we're going to find out on recall, though, because in my neuromethods course, we're taking these same animals, and we're teaching them again. So we're going to see <laughs> if they have any residual memory. Um, in theory, they should. So we're going to find out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Austin. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. Can negative reinforcement also raise cortisol levels? Um, it could possibly, but the difference between that and like baseline cortisol is that it's a very temporary thing. And as she was talking about before with like the HPA axis, that's really designed to like be a short period time thing and then to go back um, to baseline. But if their baseline is super high stress, that's a different phenomenon. So there's a lot of research on the difference between short term and long term. Long term has so many more negative effects than short term. Um, but there's a possibility that like um, a lot of other researchers use shock instead of touch because they have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so those shocks are are uh, strong enough that they don't actually cause any pain, but like shocking. Um, so it does cause like short term stress, but not nearly in the way that long term stress does. Great right, question though. If you can think, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask if the time of day had any impact. If you controlled for the time at which you were doing the tests. So, because all my students love early morning classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I don't think I thought of that specifically. That's a good question to ask. Um, but I know that for the most part, I was doing it within like, um, it was between like 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. is usually when I was there during the summer. Um, and I kind of worked around that time slot because it was a, a lot of time to be in there, so I, I had to find it. It was very long. Um, so I don't remember ever doing something like super late into the evening, um, but that's a good question to bring up for future. And it tests. would. It absolutely would. Mm -hmm. Another question? Yeah, Kathy. So, so I'm a child of the 60s <laughs> when behaviorism was uh, mm -hmm. at Alive Start. and well. Uh, very alive mm -hmm. and well and uh, being pushed down everyone's uh, Everyone's throat? <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you were interchanging punishment and negative reinforcement. And I'm just curious what's happened uh, to the definitions and... I misspoke. Uh, punishment, I know, is when you, uh, they, you're trying to decrease behavior by adding something um, or taking something away, but reinforcement is you're trying to increase a behavior by adding or taking something away. Um, so I was misspeaking, thanks for the correction. The colloquialism. Yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> this yes. is why I'm still a student. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I misspeak all the time. 
I misspeak all the time, but she is correct. We still use punishment in the way that you're thinking of okay. as far as behaviorism goes. Yeah, Amber. So you use pair housing for the experiments or for the control. Do you think there would have been a difference if you used more than two rats in a pair housing situation, like if you just kept increasing that? That was my original um, idea was I was, I really did understand the whole budget thing, so I was like, <laughs> relevant living situation, I think adding more is not going to see added benefit. Would be my hypothesis. Okay, let's fail this girl. Keep her around. <laughs> <laughs> 